the calm or serenity meditation has progressive steps in the same way the inside meditation has too. Now, inside meditation, while it has methods which I have already described, the steps are more that which we can see within ourselves through repetition of looking at ourselves without any preconceived notion. And that's a very hard thing to do. Because we are constantly looking at ourselves as me. So what we're doing is we're me looking at me. As absurd as it sounds, that what everybody does. And what we get out of it is nothing, except more problems, of course. But me looking at me cannot see anything. That's all completely covered over with the way I've always been, the way I would like to be, what I would like to have, and what I resist and reject. So there is such a conglomeration of stuff there, we can't see a thing. So what we need to do is try to see ourselves without any idea about it. And this is what the Buddha is explaining in those inside meditation methods. Looking at oneself in the way of the elements. Looking at oneself in the way of those parts of the body. Looking at oneself in the way of the aggregates the four parts of mind or the five aggregates including the body this is without any prejudice elements do not say I'm me element says I'm element no me and aggregates don't say me so it's trying to have a look as if one were an interested bystander who is analyzing and taking apart a conglomeration of bits and pieces and not the owner of those bits and pieces. If we're the owner of the bits and pieces, we always get confused again because we want to keep them, want to have them. And we worry about the outcome. Being the owner, we worry about the outcome of this analysis. Am I going to lose me? If I lose me, who have, I, who have I got left? Nobody. Or wouldn't that be great? But it doesn't sound so great at the time. I like to compare that sometimes with being the host or being the guest. If one is the owner of the house and one has invited guests into the house, the owner worries about the food. Is it going to be tasty? Is it going to be enough? Are the guests going to make holes in the carpet with their cigarettes? Are they going to take away the silverware? Are they going to enjoy themselves? Or are they going to be bored? Will they talk nicely about this party? Or will they say it wasn't uh, lavish enough? All sorts of worries. And then when everybody goes home, the owner of the place has to clean it all up and has to see to it that everything is according to the way he or she thinks it ought to be. Whereas the guest just comes there and enjoys whatever is happening and then goes home 
and forget the whole thing. We're all guests here. Nobody owns a thing, nothing. But we think we do. We think we own this house, at least that much, which is the body, in which we are ensconced for the duration. We can't even want to move out of it, no way. We can't uh, cancel the lease. It's impossibility. We've got to stick to it. So we're worried about it. It's mine. It's got to be the way it ought to be. Well, who knows how it ought to be? On, uh, these are all in the viewpoints, how it ought to be. And being the owner of this whole thing, it goes further than that, of course, as we are the owners of this thing here, then we are the owners of everything around us, which we can lay our hands on, which we can afford and which we can have, and so we uh, multiply this ownership. And if we were just a guest, wouldn't that be nice? Just think for a moment. I'm a guest. I might be around for 70 years. It's possible. Not everybody is. Mom might even be around for 80 years. But mom might just make it to 60 or 50 or 40 or whatever. But in any case, one's a guest. A guest for not a very long time <clears throat> and a guest in this body. Now, if you can use that as a takeoff point, it may make it a little clearer what it means that we have <clears throat> an ego illusion or delusion. We're guests here. We're not going to stick to this permanently. It's going to crumble and go to dust. Our whole performance here is a guest performance nobody has engaged us permanently and uh, this whole performance is often very badly done <laughs> and in spite of not being very good at it we still want applause and of course Sometimes we get it, justifiably so or not, but maybe if we could look at it that way, a guest performance, and see it, everything, like that. Now, of course, everybody is the um, main actor. That's, of course, taken for granted. We are all the main actor in our own play. But at least we can have enough consideration for all these um, supporting performers and uh, for this whole um, crew that's there to acknowledge them too and not forget that they also think they're the main actor, that they also think that they are the star of the whole play. Now, if you can use this kind of simile in any manner or form, it may help. It may help to step one step back and not be right in the middle of this year, where me seems to sit. Me seems to sit right in the middle here, between the back and the front somewhere. somewhere around here, inside. So if one can step back two steps, three steps, four steps, and just look at it, and look at oneself, and see the performance, and wonder if somebody else was performing like that, would I applaud? Put oneself into the shoes of another. Just pretend this is a show and of course we're the star I mean there's no doubt about that that has to ha 
stay like that until we've <laughs> given that up completely. But just being there as one of the um, uh, people that are watching this show and say, is this a kind of act I would really uh, appreciate if that was me? And then you look and say, hey, that is me. And maybe we could change that a little. Little by little by little. Poco a poco. It doesn't work overnight. But somewhere one's got to start. There's got to be a start somewhere. So taking a step back and watching the whole thing happening. Now all the instructions of the Buddha, and I'm reading them out to you on purpose, because I would, I, in a long course such as this, I want to make quite sure that you know that these are not my own ideas. I'm just using my own language to elaborate on them. I want you to realize quite clearly that this comes from the Buddha, from possibly the greatest spiritual master that hum humanity has ever seen because of the fact that it's clear, concise, and takes one all the way. Nothing left. Nobody. So, no problems left. We've had three insight steps so far. I'll just repeat them, huh? Mind and body are two. They each have their own function. They are interdependent. The arising and ceasing, which comes again, which will be mentioned again. And then, the cause and effect, and the cause and condition of mind and body, which we can see through watching the elements for the body, the aggregates for the mind, and recognizing, or at least, attempting to recognize that there is nobody sitting between the cause and the result. The cause is there and the result is there and both are totally impersonal. So the more we can see that through the investigation into the elements or the parts of the body and the aggregates of the mind, the more we can be an observer of this whole m mass of dukkha. Now that um, is seeing things as they really are and it over if we do that, if we actually see things in that way, we overcome doubt. And I mentioned that already, that doubt at that time has to do with not knowing whether it's me or it's not me. And both, of course, have no bearing on anything. But there's something else said about the overcoming of doubt, and I'll read you that out. With purification, by overcoming doubt, the mind becomes pure through the removal of skeptical doubt. The abandonment of views and skeptical doubts at this stage is done through the substitution of opposites. The abandonment by substitution is the abandoning of a particularly particular unwholesome thought by means of an wholesome thought. It can be compared to the dispelling of darkness by lighting a lamp. The abandonment by suppression accomplished through serenity meditation is more effective. By means of this method, one can sometimes keep the five hindrances suppressed even for a long time. Cutting off only comes through past knowledge. This is only a repetition, but I wanted you to know this repetition. This is a repetition of substitution. The substitution which is purifying and which through the jhanas is more effective and automatic. But in daily life we have to, of course, reinforce that purification uh, with our substitution. Now here, during the course, 
substitution of anything that's negative is the order of the day over and over and over if one doesn't have anything negative wonderful but if there is anything even slightly I don't like jet planes they make too much noise well that's negative substitute if one can't substitute with the opposite and this is what it says opposite right then one has to go through uh, to a um, a second defense system namely taking the mind off the negativity and putting on something entirely different I don't like jet planes I don't know how to substitute with the opposite because I'd, I'd can never like them so I'll enjoy the fountain but that's only a second line of defense the first line of defense is accepting what there is so there are jet planes so what why don't I like them well there's a long story about that and that can go on for 10 minutes at least totally unnecessary we all know why we don't like them but that's the worldly way all justified jet planes cost too much money they make too, make too much noise they pollute the environment uh, they're used for the war uh, no end of explanations for that that's the world but if we want to ever transcend the world we have to transcend also our reactions remember yesterday there's only one doorway out not to react to feeling okay now we have already reacted we don't like jet planes we are all on that we are all agreed on that that's already reacted now we have to see that doesn't help me because the more I take that in and actually keep going along with that the less peacefulness there will be so what is the opposite of that the opposite of that in this case <clears throat> will certainly not be liking them that would be absurd but the opposite of that is the acceptance of the way things are the less we push the less dukkha we've got things are the way they are I always see in my mind in that in that respect um, a little river a small river and some people don't like the way that river is running they would like it to have a different direction so they put stones in the in the path of the river like a little dam so that it changes its direction well it does change its direction what what happens where that dam is a lot of turmoil the water is churning because the stones are keeping the water and pushing it another way that's what we do in here all the time we don't like it the way it is so we put a dam so that we get something else and sometimes we are quite successful in getting something else because we've put enough dam there to either not know it or to um, uh, run away from it or whatever means we like to use but when we do that it's all churning let it be what difference does it make we're just guests here this is a guest performance this is a show that's going on so they've got jet planes in that show and dogs and cats and uh, whatever else they've got in this show it's a very um, um, well um, furnished uh, stage it's got everything on it you go out in the desert there isn't that much but here there's a lot they've got sirens and, and all sorts of things so they're having this play going on and we are the guest performers while we're here we're with it so if we let it happen and just let it go on then we don't have the 
difficulty that arises from the negative reaction. And this is what says here, um, substitute with opposite. And this has to become a habit. This is what happens on the inside path now. It becomes a habit. Not just once in a while when one remembers, not just once in a while when it becomes so painful that you can't do anything else anymore because then it's already a bit late, but really habitually. Knowing what's negative because it's unwholesome, because it hurts oneself. Wouldn't one think that only fools hurt themselves? We do it all the time, constantly. We hurt ourselves with every negativity. We could have just the opposite. We could flow with the whole thing. But, well, that's the reason why we come to meditation courses, isn't it? So that's the uh, overcoming of doubt when we learn this substitution. Now there's another thing which is maybe of help with knowing the elements. When in the meditative position you feel the body becoming heavy or even stiff, the earth element, when you feel the warmth coming up, because very often even second jhana starts out with warmth. That's the fire element. It's very useful to have that on hand, that understanding, that these elements are constantly operating. A lot of joy sometimes produces tears water element. It's again being uh, the objective observer of this whole performance that's going on. The more we observe it, the more we know that it's only a performance. And the performance is necessary naturally because what else would we be doing? I mean, we've got to do something, so we perform. But it doesn't have any intrinsic, underlying, absolute truth in it, which you can see quite clearly from its impermanence. Sometimes one can feel in the meditation also that there are winds in the body, or movement in the body. Movement in the body is the wind element. Sometimes the movement in the body is unpleasant, sometimes it can be pleasant. So use that also to have more of the ability to stand back and watch it all happening. Instead of me watching me, me can be watching the elements. It's extremely revealing. And it's interesting. What could be more interesting than finding out about oneself? I mean, we do do people watching, of course, we like that. Um, it's quite interesting too. And we can do that also with the elements. You can do people watching with elements. It's quite all right. So these are the two aspects which still belong to the third um, stage of insight or the third step of insight, the more habitual substitution through opposites, if that isn't possible, then taking the mind off completely to something else and the elements in all the stages of the meditation. This substitution through opposites, if one doesn't practice that, one can forget about the spiritual path. It doesn't work. Now that we forget sometimes, that's a different story. Everybody forgets. That is okay. That uh, can't be helped. Only Arahant is perfect. We don't have to pretend in any manner or form that we're perfect or anywhere near that. doesn't matter. Forgetting is okay, because forgetting also means remembering again. 
but not practicing it means that we think two things or one or the other or both that's the way I am that means I am pretty solid and static and I'm going to stay that way and the other one is that we think that our negativities are justified because of outside happening both are of course the worldly way of looking at it and have no room on the spiritual path that's the way the world operates that's not the way we can operate on a spiritual path so these two have to be examined and seen whether we ever have that in mind that's the way I am and the other one is that negativity is justified the next step next insight step it's called knowledge by comprehension but these names don't really mean very much it means that we are now ready to examine the three characteristics all the time now we are, have the choice of taking one or the other but <clears throat> at that point the mind usually picks one as its um, starting point but can see the other two also within the first one that one has chosen Anicca Dukkha Anatta now if we look at impermanence we can see quite clearly that that's where the Dukkha comes from the nicest thing cannot remain whatever it is that we've got that we would really like with even its jhana or whatever it may be or anything it can't stay with us and the one who is experiencing whatever it is that we like very much and you can pick whatever it is that you like best pick it out and this is what I like best maybe somebody telling me I'm wonderful or something like that whatever it is um, it also has no real real objective value because the person who is experiencing this one second later is a different person thinks, feels, acts differently now we have to eventually see impermanence in the way of having this constant flux and flow with which we can actually also flow along within Anicca we can see therefore the Dukkha now if we have everything flux and flow everything is moving and therefore is of course Dukkha then where can we find Atta where can we find the substance of me if everything changes all the time now that has to be done through the meditative and the contemplative approach and two people said today oh but I don't want to think I thought we weren't supposed to think or something along those lines now I have already explained I w would like to explain that again again because thinking and reflecting or wise consideration is not the same thing thinking has two aspects thinking is either for survival which can be instinctive trying to get away from danger or making money to live on and all the uh, adjuncts to that what one has to do or it's discursive which means it goes from one to the next and it goes on and on and on and on and sometimes it also becomes fantasy dreamlike now that's thinking and the second kind of course totally counterproductive 
and the first kind is utilitarian, and that's the world. But to put one's mind on the universal truth which the Buddha taught in order to ascertain whether that truth can be actually experienced within, that is called Joniso Maniskara, wise consideration. And of course the mind has to play a part in it. Who else would know? The mind is unenlightened and the mind becomes enlightened. There's nothing else that can do it. It's not the body, so it's got to be the mind. And with that investigation into the universal truth, we go within to find that either the confirmation or the lack of it within ourselves through the personal experience. So if we inquire into impermanence, we can notice it in ourselves quite clearly. Thoughts, feelings, breath, blood, heart, body, anything there that isn't moving. And because of not being able to keep whatever it is that we really like, we can see the dukkha even in the greatest delight. You see, the duk to see dukkha in knee pain, I mean, anybody can do that. Or to see dukkha if a loved one dies, well, I mean, we really don't have to go on a spiritual path for that. I mean, everybody knows that. But to see dukkha in sukkha, that's what the spiritual path is all about. And therefore, we need the mind for that, to see dukkha in the greatest delight. And the jhanas are the wonderful uh, pathway for that, because, I mean, they are the greatest delight. As, um, and we can see that they're impermanent quite clearly. But there again, the mind must not just say, oh yeah, yeah, I know it's impermanent, but I can do it again, there's no doubt about it. That is not sufficient. We have to watch the dissolution and really become imbued with that constant flux that is happening with everything. There's nothing that is stationary. The whole universe contracts and expands. This little globe of ours on which we seem to be sitting so solidly and safely is constantly spinning at such a high speed that we wouldn't even be able to notice it at so high speed. There's nothing stationary anywhere. This is wise consideration. Think of it. We are making ourselves to be solid on an ever-spinning universe. There's no way that that could be right, even from a scientific standpoint, never mind from an experiential standpoint. So this is um, the next step, the comprehension goes towards those three which I have already mentioned it's a, when I was talking about clear comprehension that in a meditative environment the purpose of whatever it is that we're trying to think, say or do does it lead us nearer to understanding Anicca Dukkanata that was the first purpose on a meditative, um, on a meditative s steps. If there's no joy with this, it won't happen. There has to be the joy of the spiritual journey. It's the most fascinating journey that ever can be taken far more fascinating than going from here 
to um, uh, London or Paris or uh, uh, Grand Canyon or Bryce Canyon or whatever. And I dare say, more fascinating than going to the moon. The Buddha said, the whole of the universe, O monks, lies in this fathom long body and mind. Here we can find the universe. If we don't enjoy the journey, we won't take it. Who goes on a journey they don't want, they won't enjoy? Why is it possible not to enjoy this journey? Through negativity. Negativity which is also embedded in of course, in doubt, in uh, indifference, in the five hindrances, any one of them or all of them. If they are overpowering, the journey doesn't happen. But everybody has those hindrances, up to our hand. Not all of them, but most of them. Even the non-returner still has five hindrances and there are ten, uh, five fetters and there are ten fetters altogether. So, why is it so that some people can have the joy of that spiritual journey and others can't? It is bound up with the inability for self-surrender. If we don't have the ability to surrender ourselves at least to this investigation, it can't happen. Naturally, self-surrender is necessary for meditation, self-surrender is necessary for loving-kindness. The more self there is, the less loving-kindness, the less meditation the less investigation. Because the self is like a pillar or a rock. And if it's very big, we keep on looking. Me looks at me all the time. Only when we can look around it, when there's a bit of room left there somewhere, to look at the side or around it or behind it, can we see what's really happening. Anicca Dukkha Anatta, the investigation into those three are given here by the Buddha in this formula. Any form, whatever, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all form one sees with right wisdom as it really is. This is not mine. This is not I am. This is not myself. Any feeling, any perception, any mental formation, any sense consciousness, whatever, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, he sees with right wisdom as it really is. This is not mine, this is not I am, this is not myself. This is already this thing here, what I've just read, that's the culmination of it. When one sees everything as as not I am, one has already understood it. At the point of investigation, one has to maybe put it this way, is this me? Is this sense contact I'm making me? Hearing the jet plane, who's hearing that? If the answer is always me, then do it differently. What gets the sound? Obviously the ear. What explains the sound? Obviously the mind. And who is the one that owns all that? If there were really an owner, why does this owner get unhappy? Is this owner so foolish? I am intelligent. So who is this owner that gets unhappy, worried, anxious, fearful, disliking, bored? Who is this? 
Use any imagination you have to inquire. Whatever. This is the way the Buddha worded it. But there are many other ways he worded it too. But it always boils down to this. What he's mentioning here are the four mental aggregates, right? Starting with sense consciousness, then coming to feeling, perception, mental formation. And this is the other thing that becomes an important investigation procedure on this fourth step. And that is the investigation, which I've already mentioned several times, again and again, of who is this that's sitting in there between the sense contact, which is the cause, and the reaction, which is the result. Who's sitting in the middle of all that? Through constant inquiry, it does look different. If one never inquires, there's never any chance of not being me. I mean, everybody says it's me, so it must be me. But if we inquire, it does um, show this. Another thing that we learn is if we become pinpointedly attentive, that all these, these four mental aggregates are called aggregates because they are heaps. We think that our sense contact, our feeling, our labeling, our reaction is a solid mental thing that's happening. That's how it feels to us because we don't pay enough attention. We don't have the mindfulness to recognize the fact that the whole thing are electrical impulses. But they're so fast and so subtle that they escape our notice. If we sit in meditation and become concentrated, this is a possibility of noticing. And it is very revealing. Having noticed that, one has a totally different relationship to this person which we have for norm's sake called to call me. We have a totally different relationship to that because we can see it's all electrical impulses happening all the time. And this is totally in accordance with what the scientists say that there isn't a single solid building block in the whole of the universe. There's nothing but electrical power or particles that come together and fall apart so quick that one doesn't notice it, of course, other than through a, uh, either a um, controlled uh, laboratory situation or through mindfulness. We don't have to have a controlled laboratory situation. We are our own laboratory we can find out for ourselves. Now, the scientists said this about 30, 40 years ago. The Buddha said it two and a half thousand years ago. The same thing. There isn't any solid building block anywhere. Now, because we think we are solid, and we look so solid, don't we? I mean, we all look pretty solid. Um, this is why this um, whole delusion which is a totally optical delusion to start out with, has arisen. We have an optical delusion that everybody is a separate entity. I mean, there are all these different people sitting here on these different cushions. Everybody looks different, everybody talks different, everybody thinks <coughs> different. So it must be a person, must be a me. And then there's all these trees and birds and dogs and cats, and it's all different. Everything is different. But this is an optical thing. And we believe our eyes, but in reality there is no such thing. And if we become more and more one-pointed and use that one point, concentrated, in the meditation to investigate these four parts of mind, we can become aware of the fact that they are heaps, that they have that, they have that um, blip consistency, or blips coming together and that 
as nobody sitting in between the sense consciousness or sense contact and the reaction. Nobody. There's nobody there. It's just happening. And when we see that, if we have done the jhanas nicely, there's no problem. And if we haven't, we mightn't like it. And then we have to do the substitution with opposites. When we don't like it, that is, of course, it can be quite strong. It can be so strong that we absolutely reject it out of hand. If there's nobody there, why should I be meditating? Well, that's another question, isn't it? <laughs> the uh, the khandas, uh, heaps, uh, aggregates, khandas is a part of it. The aggregates is now the important matter of investigation in meditation and seeing the three characteristics in them. That they're all impermanent, we know we can easily see that. That every thought, every sense contact is impermanent. I mean, that's was really not difficult. But the dukkha in them, everything that moves has friction. Everything that has friction irritates dukkha. Thinking is dukkha not just by meditating. Thinking is always dukkha. And if we notice that, eventually, we'll finally know that existence is dukkha. And that's the first noble truth. Being is dukkha. It's all moving and therefore friction, and all friction hurts. So watch the four parts of mind with reference to not only their impermanence but with reference to their dukkha and of course with reference to their non-containing, not containing a me. That's the three characteristics embedded in the parts of mind. And this is what this four-step of comprehension is all about. Um, here's another um, clue how to see impermanence. One sees impermanence in the sense of undergoing destruction. Everything that arises, thought, feeling, everything, sense content, it arises and it gets destroyed. There's constant destruction going on. Now that shows the dukkha again. That a new one arises doesn't change that at all because that too gets destroyed. But because of continuity we do not see the impermanence. And because of the seeming solidity, we do not see the anatta. And because we take our mind off and go somewhere else with the mind, we don't see dukkha. The reality of dukkha is that all existence, just being, is dukkha. If the nature of impermanent is apparent, the painful nature and the not-self nature of all formations becomes apparent as well. So it is, doesn't matter which one of the three one starts out with, every one of them contains the other two. And they all lead to that insight into the fact that we are living under uh, the great delusion which makes life pretty complicated, which makes life on this planet not only complicated but so difficult that only if 
a minority of people can live at an even pace. Most people's lives are not only very difficult but very often also chaotic. So the uh, the delusion that we live under makes that so. There's another way of looking at it which the Buddha said. It is impermanent because it wears away. It is painful because it's terrifying. It's not self because it's coreless. The not self means the corelessness means there's no real substance in the middle of it all. Now if you can see the impermanence, you can see that there's no real substance in the middle of it all. Because if everything changes and wears away, there's no core there. And the painfulness of being terrified, that is the reason why most people don't really want to know. Because if we did know, we would certainly make every effort to get out and forget all other efforts. So this, that it is actually terrifying, is the one thing that we don't want to know about. But this is one of the things which is extremely helpful for jhana meditators. They always have recourse to a state of being which is peaceful and joyful. And therefore the terror, which is one of the steps on the inside, I haven't got that far yet, um, does not arise at all or so minor that it isn't are of great importance. But without that, it can appear that the dukkha is too much to actually become uh, imbued with it. And yet, the minute we accept it, it's okay. That's just the way it is. It's our resistance which makes it terrifying. I don't want it that way. I want it nice and pleasant. I don't want all this dukkha. But the minute we see it for what it is, it's perfectly all right. So that's it. It's a universal truth and it leads us eventually, if we can incorporate it into us as uh, absolute reality, then it leads us out. Leads us out leads us out of all the um, difficulties and all the um, dangers. Now, one is supposed to also look, and this is according to the Buddha's instructions, what are called at the three modes, past, future and present. Which means that we look at having seen Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta with some insight, we can look to see whether there's anything in the future which promises anything different, or whether there was anything in the past which was different, or whether it's always like that. And added to that, we also look into four pairs internal, external, gross, subtle, inferior, superior, found, near. Now internal, external is probably the one that we should pay most attention to. Internal is within us, ourselves. Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. Is it true for out there? Is it true for my neighbor? Is it true for the dog? Is it true for the house? Is it true for the, the bush? Is it true for the moon? Is it true whatever? Look at everything. There's plenty of stuff just standing in the middle of the little patio there. And see, is it true? Is it all anicca, dukkha, anatta? 
or can I find something external that isn't? Now surely that's better than disliking something. It's much better to investigate, isn't it? And whether one comes to the same conclusion as the Buddha or not is not really the criteria. The criteria is the investigation. The criteria is the journey. Look, is it anicca dukkanatta internally or can I find something within, anywhere, within this fathom long body and mind? Can I find anything that does not comply with anicca dukkanatta? And if I can find it, let me investigate it. And externally. Gross or subtle, gross is the body. Subtle are our feelings, our reactions, our um, modes of meditation, they're more subtle. Investigate the jhanas. Investigate the attention on the breath. Is it anicca dukkanatta or isn't it? Find out the attention on the breath or the non-attention on the breath, investigate it, find out what it is. And far or near, I've already said that, near, we ourselves are near, far, sky, moon, whatever. It means everything, nothing excluded. So, and with inferior or superior, it means all modes of existence. So anything that, from stone to whatever we can think of, as far as the imagination will go. So these are called the eleven modes, past, future, and present, and those four pairs, which means that we really use our mind to investigate those three which are the ones which are called insight if we see them clearly. Insight in the Buddha's terminology always means recognizing that those three or one of the three which leads to recognizing all three. Now there are many other insights which come on the way there, the, uh, to them, to seeing in that way. But they all need to lead in that direction. And that's what insight is all about. So we can make those um, investigations as a meditation or as a contemplation, either way. Here's another way that the Buddha was looking at the five aggregates. And it's a discourse to a person called Magandiya. And when Magandiya, you have practiced the Dhamma, going the Dhamma way, then Magandiya, you will know for yourself, you will see for yourself, that these five aggregates are but veritable diseases, boils and dark. So that is the way the Buddha looked at, at the five aggregates because we can see that they are never totally satisfying. Now we have to find that out for ourselves and we're perfectly at liberty to say no, no, it's wrong, Buddha is wrong. It's in, we're perfectly at liberty whether that's going to make us happy or not is the second question but we're perfectly at liberty to say whatever. There was a man who came to the Buddha crying and sobbing and lamenting and Buddha said to him, why are you crying? What's the matter? And the man said, I've just lost my only beloved son. He just died. And the Buddha said, what one loves brings sorrow. The man said, what nonsense? How can Buddha say such a thing? And immediately walked away and told all his friends that the Buddha didn't know at all what went on with humanity 
that he had said what one love brings sorrow and his friend said oh but it's true you you yourself are crying because you love this boy he still wouldn't believe it so we're perfectly at liberty to think anything we like whether it's going to help us or not that is entirely up to us but we must investigate this is the investigation the inquiry into the three characteristics which are so extremely um, important now here <laughs> there is um, another a list which is quite interesting how to see the five aggregates in 40 different modes <laughs> so I'll read you that <laughs> we can see them as impermanent painful as a disease a boil a dart a calamity an affliction as alien as disintegrating as a plague a disaster a terror a menace fickle perishable unenduring as no protection no shelter no refuge empty vain void not self as a danger subject to change as having no core as a root of calamity as murderous as to be annihilated as subject to cankers as formed as Mara's bait as subject to birth to aging to illness to death to sorrow to lamentation to despair to defilement and there it says that the, there are 10 of these illustrate impermanence 25 illustrate dukkha and 5 anatta the anatta is illustrated through alien empty vain void and not self that's a adjective used now out of these 40 modes of comprehension the meditator should take up for reflection only those which make sense to him so pick one <laughs> <laughs> Everybody will pick a, 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 an individual one. <laughs> That's the way it should be. You see, one's, one's triggers are individual. The absolute truth, the results are always the same. But the individual triggers are, are individual. So, um, are different. So we pick out whatever we like. Look at them. Look at these aggregates, the five aggregates. And the Buddha said, that's all we are. And see how does how do they strike you? Do they still strike you as being your means for pleasure? Do they still strike you as your means for um, bringing happiness to yourself? Do they strike you as self and self support, or do they strike you as being difficult at least that much and then see where it takes you so this is uh, the way that uh, the Buddha tried to make us see things a little differently than the way we do and this is what it's all about that we see ourselves in the world differently and recognizing and acknowledging that the way we've seen it up to now hasn't brought anything it's brought just being there having a few sense pleasures which are impermanent surviving but having lots of dukkha that we have to see if we don't see that then why should we want to get out of it so seeing ourselves and the world totally differently not in this mode of being that which really is and the only thing that is but only as a passing show that's all it is just a passing show and if you look at it as a passing show it's quite amusing actually 
and oneself is the one one can be amused about if we're not amused about ourselves we haven't quite seen it yet when we start smiling about ourselves and recognizing that we are actually seeing the important as unimportant and the unimportant as important and that which is dukkha is sukha and that what is sukha is dukkha and then smile at that foolishness then we're starting to see it and then it also quite nice to take this journey in fact it's not only interesting but it has a feeling of um, fulfillment even just taking the journey one has to be prepared everybody who goes on a journey prepares I mean people take a little suitcase along and they buy a ticket and uh, they know where they're going and they might take a companion so we've got to be prepared and wear the right clothes to go on the journey and all that so the meditation prepares us for this inside journey and this is the uh, the uh, meaning of the path all right any questions comments yes unrelated to last night you talked about some small stream entry or tiny stream entry was that related to some insight Mm-hmm. And are there a number of those, or just any insight? Is that a no. Um, uh, there, are there a number of those? Streams or whatever? No, 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 no. There's, uh, there's only one stream entry. Um, you mentioned a lot of the smaller streams. Yeah, that's right. I'll just get, I'll just uh, find it just a minute. It's right here. Um, the understanding of cause and effect cause and conditions, right, is not based on assumption. It's something that occurs to the meditator as an indubitable experience. At this stage, although real insight still has not yet reached completion, the mind possesses great strength. This is a stage with special significance since the meditator who has come this far becomes a lesser, or it's called a lesser, stream entra, chula satapana. Chula means small, but it's sounds better lesser if he preser- if he preserves this knowledge of conditionality intact up to the time of death unimpaired by doubts and waverings in the next existence he's certain not to be reborn into any of the lower realms which is one of the results of having stream entry um, a lesser stream entra is a person that has gained insight to that point uh, and doesn't doubt or waver, but does hasn't seen Nibbana, because Nibbana is a um, is a letting go of self for a moment. So that's then a um, not a lesser stream enter, but a stream enter. But even this is already nice. <laughs> there are other ma- ways and means of becoming a lesser stream enter. And that is sometimes it is called, uh, also said by the Buddha, a person who has absolutely no doubt in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, complete and utter confidence, faith, trust and surrender to Buddha Dhamma Sangha. is also, because of that, because of that great love and devotion, is also called a lesser stream entra. And they also get because this is a very strong mind moment to have this complete surrender uh, they get born with that again because as I made that um, comparison when you go to bed at night with certain thoughts and feelings you can have them back in the morning without even having to think again so it's the same with dying what you die with you can get back immediately when you wake up again so your next life has that as a um, influence, as a strong influence. So this is an inside one, and the other one is a, a devotion one.
a complete devotion. But this inside one is a conditionality, brings of complete conditionality, brings with it already the understanding that there's nobody here, that everything is cause and effect. And that has brought about this particular person. We are totally brainwashed to think otherwise. And um, it's all really a matter of investigating without prejudice and seeing it differently and then re-arousing that different way of seeing it so that the mind can shift. It is as if the mind has to shift. Anything else? In investigating the uh, um, cause and effect, there's the six sense doors and I have um, a difficulty in comprehending thinking because of the object hitting the sense door. Mm -hmm. Whereas, for instance, with that candle, it's something that you can also touch, it's something you could also hear, and that everyone here would agree that the candle would see it. With, with a thought, I have difficulty seeing where, what the object is that's striking the sense door. The idea. It's always called an idea. This, the sense door of the mind uh, gets the idea and the sense door of the mind come together and thinking starts. You can notice that when you watch yourself. Well, I can notice the idea up here, but for example, like with, with that candle, I can see that candle and everyone in the room can see that, that candle and I can say what color is it someone else can say white. If I have a memory that seems to only only belong to me. And to oh, me. your own memory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well that's, uh, if that's, you see, then you would be memory. No? Huh? Okay, so where are you then at night when you don't have memory? disappeared and if you have memory now at this point in time at this moment maybe you have rem memory of when you were in uh, fifth grade okay put yourself back in fifth grade can you remember okay right now put yourself in tenth grade so which one are you which one of the memories are you or you have memory of what you had for lunch today. So? So you must be billions of me's with billions of memories. Or you are the me of, of that particular memory at that particular moment. Check it out. Well, let, me, let me put it another way. Um, <laughs> I still don't I guess what I can't see is what is the object that's striking the sense door. When you're thinking, or what? Or when you're seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling? Yeah, only the thinking. With the rest. With thinking. Yeah, well, the idea. But where does it come from? Yeah, well, find out. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that you are producing it? Well, if you were producing it, why do you then produce it at a time you don't want it at all, when you'd rather be in the eighth jhana, for instance, and then all of a sudden you get an idea and start thinking? I mean, why? Who's doing that? Is there a little devil there somewhere that's doing that? And other times when the little devil is having a nap, then you can <laughs> have it the way you like it. I mean, that's actually the way we look at it. It's quite amazing, but without a spiritual path, we have a... ...we have on this globe. I mean, to this day, people fight with each other because of their religion. 
I mean, nothing could be more absurd than that. So we are very primitive. We look at things in this primitive way. So we have to really change our whole outlook. And I mean negativity, they're also a primitivity. Well, what do we need negativities for? Who are we, what are we doing this for? It must be that little devil again or somebody. Some. Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Think of all the nice things that you've ever done in your life, such as helping another person, being concerned about another's welfare, being loving and kind to another one. giving a present anything that you can think of that you think was a good thought or deed remember it now and then feel warm and loving towards yourself recognizing all the goodness in yourself Think of the people who are close to you. Think of all the good deeds that they've ever done. Those that you know and those that you surmise. Appreciate them and love them. Because of that goodness that you can feel in them. Think of the people you know. Let them arise before your mind's eye. And think of all the good deeds that you know about them or that you surmise in them. Feel your heart going out to them. Appreciating, loving, respecting.
the goodness in them. Think of those people who are part of your life but towards whom you feel quite indifferent. You meet them here and there but you don't have any real connection to them. Think of all the good things that they've done possibly for you. Appreciate and love them, respect them. Make your heart reach out to them. Now think of anyone whom you don't like or who's bothering you in any way and then think of all the good things that that person has ever thought, said or done whether you were actually present or not Appreciate and respect that person for his or her goodness. Let your heart go out to him or her. Feeling the sameness, the oneness that all of us unite. Think of people in your hometown, those you know and those you don't know. Remember all the good things you know about them, surmise the others. Appreciate them.
Let your heart reach out and connect with their heart. And now think of people everywhere in the towns, in the cities, villages, on the land all of them looking for happiness all of them having goodness in their hearts Connect with that goodness, connect with their hearts. Let your appreciation, your warmth, your respect for all these beings flow out of your heart. and help to lift the consciousness that is present in humanity. Now put your attention back on yourself. And feel the ease that comes. The consciousness goes to goodness and lovingness. Feel the mind feels lighter, pleased, carefree, and the heart feels loving. Connect with the goodness in yourself. See it clearly. Anchor that recognition within your heart so you can retain it. never lose sight of it.
can feel the appreciation and the warmth welling up in you connected to that goodness. May beings everywhere appreciate and respect each other. 